Radio Metropolis. Welcome to the Suspense Radio Podcast here on Radio Retropolis. Tonight, an author hears strange music and other noises from apartments surrounding him, only to find out its tenants are being murdered. This is Dream Song from November 6th, 1947, here on the Suspense Radio Podcast on Radio Retropolis. Suspense. Tonight's Suspense brings you as star Mr. Henry Morgan. Each week you hear Mr. Morgan as prime comedian on his own radio show. Tonight he appears in a role different from any he's ever played before. And now, Shenley brings you radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines of Fresno, California. And starring Henry Morgan... In Dream Song, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. The apartment was one and a half rooms, about enough space to turn around, sleep, and eat in. But it was enough for a bachelor like me, and I felt lucky. I'd had to move out of my last place in sort of a hurry. You know how you get pushed around nowadays. And I had no real right expecting anything even halfway decent to turn up for me so soon. I went about installing myself, which merely means bringing in my old studio couch, an old chair, about three trillion books, a couple of Matisse prints, and my typewriter. And I was all set in a day or two and ready to get down to real work on the book. One evening, I came in after a good dinner and sat down to finish off a sequence. It wasn't writing easy. I felt that I was getting off on a tangent. I was going a million miles away from what I wanted to say, and it annoyed me. It was then that I heard it for the first time. It was coming from the next apartment, and coupled with my bad writing, it was very annoying. I tried to ignore it, but that couldn't be done. I got up and walked around the room a few times. That didn't help any. So I sat down and tried to write again. But I was tough, and the right words came like water from a closed faucet. And then the music stopped. And it was suddenly very peaceful. I felt my mind settle down. I started once more. There, it was going along pretty well now. I was thinking clearly, the phrases were right, the mood was good, the dialogue, and the thing started up again. I yanked the paper out of the machine and tossed it into the wastebasket. I was through for the night. A few nights later, after spending the entire day reading, which is so much more delightful than writing... I decided it was about time to sit down and start pounding it out. It was a beautiful night. It took a lot of willpower to tear myself away from the window. I smoked a couple of cigarettes and decided I'd start work after them. Then smoked a few more and listened to the night noises of the city. After that, I searched my pockets for some more cigarettes, but I didn't have any. So I took a deep breath, reluctantly turned my back on the city, and sat down at my work table. There was a story in the paper that I wanted to keep because it was sort of like the situation I was writing about, and I was cutting it out. Then, almost as though it was timed, that canned music started up. Well, that settled my work for the night again, I thought. That fool in the next apartment, whoever he or she might be, was probably planning to serenade himself for hours on end. 
And yet, strangely enough, I half hoped that the music would go on. It was a very lovely evening, and I was looking for the slightest excuse to lounge around. I just started thinking of going for a walk when the music stopped. In the stillness that followed, I could hear steps. And then a door opening and closing, and then a long, long silence. Then I was back at my typewriter, and everything was fine. The words were coming right from my brain to my fingers. And as I wrote, I could see the next line, and the next. And then, while I was working, I became conscious of the next door footsteps, and it disturbed me. I sat up, stretched, yawned, looked at my watch. One o'clock in the morning. I hadn't realized it was that late. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Mr. Kenyon, the janitor. Uh, please open the door. What's wrong? Well, you always come around at one in the morning. Excuse it, please, Mr. Kenyon. Are you I... Charles Kenyon? Of course. What is it? He's from the police station, Mr. Kenyon. Here you are. I'm Sam Fields from this precinct. Can I come in? Come right in. What's this all about? Apartment 4D, Mr. Rhodes. Why don't been... you share that? Kenyon, you've been home all night? Yes, I have. What have you been doing here all night? Mr. Kenyon's a Look, writer. Look, are you going to keep your trap shut? Go ahead, Kenyon. Well, I'm a writer, and I've been working all evening. That's about all. You didn't hear no noise, no commotion? No. What's happened? The man in apartment 4D has been killed, <clears throat> murdered. Oh, the floor is all what? covered with blood. Oh, we'll never get it off without scraping. That'll run up a bill, too. 4D. That's two flights up? Oh, he was a pretty good guy, that Mr. Rodson. But he gave me five for We're Christmas. We're just in here checking up. I don't suppose you knew him. No, I didn't. Well, he must have been killed a short time ago. The coroner's upstairs now. The janitor here heard a struggle and phoned in. Yeah, I live in 4E now. The owner chopped the basement up into three apartments. Or well, he makes a barrel of money that way, Mr. you see. Mr. Rodson and was I, just I... about dead when we got there. I'm surprised you didn't hear us go up. I was uh, busy writing. Yeah, it must have been. Oh, all that blood on the floor. We, we'll never get it off. By the next tenant, will have to paint the floor red, I tell you. Uh, how was he killed? He was stabbed in the back with a sharp and steel. Yeah, yeah he was stabbed in Not the back. Not a knife, the doc says. It could be maybe a shears or scissors. Well, we looked all around, but you couldn't find no scissors. The murderer isn't giving out souvenirs this week. Well, Mr. Kenyon, I guess you're okay. We may want you to come down to headquarters for a few questions tomorrow. If so, I'll let you know. Yes, of course. You can go back to your writing now. <clears throat> Hey, what do you write? Detective stories? No, about, uh, about people. Yeah? <laughs> That's who commits the murders, two people. Although I must say some of my best friends are people. What'd you write tonight? I don't see nothing around. I, uh, I don't like to have people see it, you know, until it's finished. You know, I got a tenant already for that apartment. Maybe that's why the guy was knocked off, so someone could get the apartment. Uh, what about his wife? Oh, four D's got no wife. Now, I know he's got a young lady, but he is a bad All right, all right, all right. We ain't uh, interested uh, in gossip. Come on, let's go. Oh, I'll be seeing you, Mr. Kenyon. Yes. Uh, good night. One night, a week after that, I was lying in bed trying to sleep. I don't know why I couldn't sleep. I've been working hard all day. I was dead tired. My legs felt heavy, but my brain, instead of feeling dull, was sharp and alert. Quite suddenly, and for no reason, I felt waves of chills run along my spine. I sat up in bed, reached for a cigarette. I looked at my watch. 2.20, and I'd wanted to get up at 7. I snuffed out the butt and leaned back. Somehow, I seemed a bit more relaxed now. I closed my eyes and felt comfortable, tired out. And then there it was again. That music. And I was wide awake again and tense and jumpy as a cat. I don't know why it made me feel that way, but it did. It went on and on. Sometimes it would seem to be fading away. Then it would be loud again. And then... Fade away. I crouched beneath the covers and drew the pillow over my head. That was better. I could still hear it, but it wasn't so bad. And it seemed to get farther and farther and farther away. And I was so tired. 
exhausted by now. I heard that sort of thump from somewhere upstairs. But it didn't matter now. All I cared about was sleep. Sleep. Just sleep. Uh, oh, what was that? Of course I'm all right. Just a minute, I'm still in bed. Can a man sleep around here oh, without I people? I didn't know you were sleeping. You always sleep this late, Ken. Oh, Inspector, I didn't recognize you. I guess I'm still a little bleary eyes. Come on in. I ask if you always sleep this late. Twelve. I guess it is late. No, I don't usually, but I couldn't get to sleep last night. Uh, last night, shut yes. up. Kenyon, do you know the guy who lives upstairs? That was Mr. Blackwell, the lawyer. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't know anyone around here. I do my work, that's all I know. Look, you asked me these questions the last time you were here. Yeah, 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 I know, and I'm asking them again. Mr. Blackwell, he's been killed. Killed? Upstairs? Yep, killed the same way. Floor just filled with blood, just like 4D. Well, last night I did hear something. Hmm? I didn't think it was anything then. It was just a sound, like a table or something falling over from upstairs. There was no table falling. What time do you think you heard it? A little while after I went to bed. A little after 2 a.m. Mr. Blackwell divorced his wife five months ago. She was such a nice woman. Coroner says death took place around that time. You didn't hear anything else, did you? What? I said, did you hear anything else? Anything else? Anything else? that music. But I couldn't tell him about that. I couldn't tell it to a detective. Or that terrible feeling I had when I heard it. It would sound silly, crazy. I yes, could... yes. Did you hear anything else? No. No, I didn't hear anything else. I went to sleep right after that, and I didn't wake up until you rang the bell just now. Mr. Blackwell gave me a ten for Christmas, but he never smiled. He was a very We've sad man. We've been checking up to see if everyone else oh. is all right. Has anyone else? No, 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 no. Just this guy above you. I, I guess we got some sort of maniac operating in this area. Well, he tries to get me. He's going to get a big surprise. I got a license to carry a gun. I got a good gun, too. My son brought it to me from Germany. <laughs> well, now, don't go shooting the tenants just because they don't pay the rent. <laughs> Everybody pays the rent here. Oh, did you ever see a guy with no sense of humor? Well, this whole thing doesn't seem particularly funny. <laughs> well, don't you worry about it, Mr. Kenyon. You've got the whole police force protecting you, so don't worry about it at all. Well, I'll probably be seeing you. So long. So long. Uh, good, uh, goodbye, Mr. Kenyon. Oh, uh, Mr. Torsten, yeah. will you stay a moment? I'd like you to do something for me. Why, uh, sure, sure. Mr. Torsten, you seem to know a good deal about everyone in the building. I don't snoop around. Oh, I'm the janitor. I, I, I just see them I and know, other people I, don't see I them. I know. I, I didn't mean it that way. I just want to ask you a question or two. Uh, this Mr. Blackwell who was killed, he was living alone, wasn't he? Yeah, like I told you, he was married, but uh, his wife moved out. Do you know it's harder to take blood off the floor than it is from the walls? You can paint the walls, but the floor has to be scraped uh, and sanded. Something, something. Uh, what about my uh, my neighbor to the left next door? Oh, uh, 2E? Well, I don't know too much about him. I just seen him once. He never bothers me. His name is Williams. Has he uh, got a phonograph? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got lots of records for the phonograph, too. I seen them when they put the telephone in. That was the only time I was ever in his place. I see. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Torsten. Oh, that's it. Well, say, thank you, Mr. Kenyon. And if there's ever any time you ever want anything... Don't be afraid to ask. No, I... I won't be afraid. No, I... I won't be afraid. For the first time in my life, I felt genuinely afraid. Because it was something you couldn't know, couldn't fight. An innocent knock on the door, you open it, the next thing that happens is you're found in a pool of blood. With that intolerable canned music coming from next door. I wondered what that Williams looked like, living next door. Why should he play that one record over and over again when he had so many? Torsten said that. And I wondered what he sounded like. The house phone. Yes, Mr. Kenyon? 
Uh, give me Mr. Williams' apartment, too. He... The music started. That meant he was in, and I could find out what it sounds like. Why doesn't he answer? He's there. Maybe he knows I'm calling. Maybe he can hear me call. Shall I keep ringing, sir? Well, why doesn't he... Well, no. Never mind, operator, never mind. I was certain that Williams had heard me call him on the phone. Had been, as a matter of fact, waiting for me to call... From that day on, I left peace of mind behind. I thought of moving, but there was no place to go. I smoked more and more. I sat for hours in a dark movie in the park in the public library reading room. And still that record revolved in my ears. If only I could get to know who this Williams was. If I could get to see him. If I could get to observe him somehow without his observing me. I was in the park when I thought of it. I could see our windows from the park. I hurried home. I searched in a drawer for my one war souvenir, my German liberated binoculars. Powerful 8 by 50 Zeiss field glasses. There they were, still dusty. I wiped them with my shirt, went back downstairs to survey the terrain. I hurried over to the park, my heart beating like a trip hammer. Leaned against the body of an old auto, trying to look at ease. I looked up at William's window. The Venetian blinds were raised. I looked around, no one in sight. Quickly, I unslung my binoculars, held them up to my eyes. What was I focused on? That wasn't William's window, that was mine. There was a window. To the left? Should be just about there. There it was. The window. Just as though I were a few yards from it. Having fun, buddy? No. Uh, no, officer, I, uh... See anything good? Uh, look, officer, I... I yeah, think... yeah, I know. You're trying to spot planes. Yeah, trying to spot planes. Why don't you try spotting them from the roof? Well, I, uh, never spotted anything from the roof. Look, wise guy, I'll give you a tip. I'm easy going. But when headquarters gets on my tail, I gotta play rough. Now, somebody puts in a complaint, and I catch you causing trouble, I'll run you in. You understand? Well, I... Well, so far, there's been no complaint. Now, let's just leave it that way, huh? So just beat it now before I change my mind. For two days after that, the thought of that cop catching me with the binoculars made me tremble. I found my hand shaking when I lit a cigarette. Couldn't eat. I knew that I must find some way to reassure myself about Williams or I'd lose my mind. One morning, after I'd spent a sleepless night listening and watching... The music went on. My plan was to wait till the music stopped. Possibly then Williams would go out. And as soon as he left, I'd slip out and follow him. I waited while that music ground out. That metallic sediment squeezed out through a loudspeaker. Nine o'clock. Nine thirty. Ten o'clock. 10.30. My head started to go round and round like the record under the needle. 11 o'clock. The music still kept on. And on. And on. <gasps> Suddenly I sat up quickly. Looked at my watch. 3 o'clock. I'd been sleeping. But the record, it was still... Austin. Mr. Kenyon. Mr. Kenyon. Torsten. Torsten, he always talks about blood. Mr. Kenyon, did you say something? Don't you come in here! Don't come in here! Oh, Mr. Kenyon, what's the matter? You keep away, Torsten, you keep away from it! Keep away? All right, all right, only I, I was just going to tell you, don't use the incinerator for a while. We're cleaning it out for the next couple of hours. And, uh, incinerator? Yeah. Oh. 
Well, why tell me? Uh, we tell everybody. We don't keep it no secret. Mr. Williams, too? Well, he pays his rent. Only he's not home. I just knocked, didn't I? Yeah, but you came in here with a key. Why? Because I hear you yell like a bull. I thought maybe something was wrong. Maybe, maybe something is wrong with Mr. Williams. Why don't you open his door? Look, Mr. Kenyon, I don't go around opening people's doors with you for the fun of it. I got a job to keep. I got a reputation to think of. If you think a super's job is easy, you got it all wrong. I didn't mean it that way. Well, okay. Only, please, don't use the incinerator, huh? Oh. Why did Williams' records stop just before Torsten knocked? Why didn't he answer Torsten's call? He wanted privacy. Privacy to play his record. Every day for the next week, that music played at the strangest hours. It became a personal message to me. I was next. Get ready, Kenyon. You're next to have the floor of your apartment scraped, the walls done over... Many times I thought of calling the police. But what could with that do? No one would believe me just because of a record. No one would believe me without some proof. That was it. Proof. Something that would stand up in court before a judge, before a jury. Yeah, but before I could get that, he might creep into this room. Slowly, quietly, while I was asleep, while I was in that bed, helpless as a child. Hour after hour, I walked the streets trying to think, to reason my way out. Yesterday, I sat huddled in a chair all day. The music didn't play at all. About seven o'clock, I went out for something to eat. In the evening paper, there was an item that could be the basis for a good short story. And when I got back, I started to clip it out. And then I got my nerves again. I locked the door. I went to both the windows. I locked one window... Then I went to the other one. Wait a minute. This window was the window with the fire escape. Whose window was that on the other side of the fire escape? It was his window. William's window. I stared at it as though I were hypnotized. The light was on. That meant he was home. Maybe I could... Maybe I could crawl out on the platform, peek in through the window. Maybe I could get a look at him. As I was thinking these thoughts, the music sounded... And I started to sweat. Cold, icy sweat. I started to close the window, but I, I caught myself and I pushed it back open. With the palms of my hands wet, I climbed up on the window ledge and I crawled out on the fire escape. And I made my way along the iron bars as silently as I could. And the window was just in front of me. And I felt my throat go dry and I leaned my head over to try and look in. I swallowed hard and tried to keep my body concealed. The Venetian blinds were drawn all the way, but they were slanted in such a way that permitted me to see inside. I craned my head forward and looked. It was dark inside, but I could make out the living room and the phonograph, large cabinet machine. There was a couch, and there, there was a man. It seemed as though he was dancing. Swaying to the music. And it kept getting louder. And he kept coming towards me. Nearer and nearer. He must have seen me. And I couldn't move. And he kept coming nearer. Moving in the shadows. Nearer. Nearer. Ah! came out of it, I was in my own apartment, lying on my own couch, and Inspector Fields was there and a lot of other people. Ah, uh, he'll be okay now. Did you get him? Did you get him? Yeah, they, they got him. They think. They think? Don't they know? It was Williams. I saw him in his room. He was coming at me. He was going to kill me. I was going to be next. He was coming at me there uh, in the take dark. Take it easy, Kenyon. Take it easy. That wasn't Williams. That was me. Oh. Listen, Inspector, there's something I haven't told you. Something I heard the other two times. Yeah? I thought it would sound crazy, but I heard music. A song. An old song. An old record. Yeah? What was it? It was I'll See in My Dreams. Heard it again tonight in William's room. He was playing it. Yeah, I guess you heard it tonight, all right. 
And I heard it the other two times, too. The same way, same song. Maybe you heard it, and maybe you just thought you heard it. How much do you remember? Do you remember coming at me with those scissors? Scissors? Kenyon, we found your other apartment. The one you moved out of a month ago. My other apartment? Mm Mm-hmm. And we found your wife. I... I don't have a wife. No, but you did. And that song you were talking about, it uh, was on the phonograph. And your wife, she was dead. They made me talk to a doctor today. Hallucinations, he said. Hearing that song that way, I sort of remember Alice. She was playing a record and I was clipping something out of... Well, I... I don't know what to believe. Because I thought the song was real. And the woman, the dead woman... I thought that was a dream. Just a bad dream. They wouldn't... They wouldn't hang a man for a dream. Would they? Suspense. Dream Song, starring Henry Morgan, presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Be sure to listen next Thursday, same time, to Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And that was Dream Song from November 6th, 1947, here on the Suspense Radio Podcast on Radio Metropolis. This was yet another good suspense-driven episode, not so much in the whodunit scope, as very little in these episodes offer that. I assume the person telling us the story was the one who was instigating everything. The suspense part of the story was in trying to figure out how he could have been the murderer and what the music meant, what significance it had, as the title of this episode is Dream Song, which tells us the music he heard was most likely in his head and it was haunting him to the point of torture. Well, that only signifies one thing in these stories, guilt. Henry Morgan starred tonight as we... I don't believe I've heard him prior to this in any suspense episode. I could be wrong, but I'll check on that. Uh, But I don't think so. He started out in radio at age 16 as a page boy and soon became the youngest announcer in radio. From there, he got his very own show, Meet Mr. Morgan, on New York's WOR radio. The premise of the show was for Henry to vent his frustrations of what was current in the news or just his general observances of everyday life, his observations. He forever became known as the humorist with the acerbic wit. They decided to rotate him with another radio series, one that we feature here on Radio Metropolis. You might know it. It's called The Adventures of Superman. Yeah, to have acerbic wit mixed with a kid's show. <laughs> if you listen to some of the more successful radio talk show hosts over the last, I would say, 30 years. This is 2024 I'm recording this. So we're talking about Steve Dahl in, from Chicago's The Loop, if you recall. That's where I grew up. Tom Likas and, of course, Howard Stern. They all have one man to thank who kick-started that whole shock jock format. And that's Henry Morgan. Granted, Morgan was not as crude as those other jocks, wasn't as forth, uh, you know, forward as much in, in that kind of lascivious uh, sort of behavior. But it was a much different time. It was still biting and, as I said, acerbic, and he cut to the chase. It was, you didn't want to be on the other side of that comment from Morgan, I'll tell you that. He did, however, vent his frustrations in a way that you hear in the sterns of the world. And according to Morgan's bio, his show made, quote, slanderous comments towards his sponsors, mainly to either spite his executives or to whet his appetite for the outrageous, fascinated the audience's attention and brought them back week after week, unquote. 
That sounds like Howard Stern to me. As a matter of fact, I think that was even used in the Howard Stern movie, that same description. Why do I love Howard Stern? It's because I can't wait to hear what he has to say next. And for those that hated Howard Stern, still listen to him. Why do you listen to him? Because I want to hear what he has to say next. Same thing here. Henry Morgan kicked it all off. Joe Kearns mentioned the words, Ever Sharp Schick Razors, but we didn't hear the name of the show. I didn't know if that was intentional or just a rough edit, but they were referring to the name of the show, The Henry Morgan Show, that he was starring in, Henry was, on another program in another network. That's kind of what that was. Ever uh, Ever Sharp Schick Razors was his sponsor. The Henry Morgan Show received a Peabody Award Special Citation of Honor in 1946, so just right around this time, a little before. Kearns also announced Morgan's debut as a film actor with the starring role in Stanley Kramer's So This Is New York, about a small-town man who inherits a fortune and takes his family to New York City, where he runs into the most unusual characters the city has to offer. Now, the thought behind that was to redraft the script to suit Morgan's radio persona. But what worked in radio didn't quite translate to this movie. And he didn't really do many movies after that. Most people would remember Morgan as a panelist on I've Got a Secret, where he joined in June of 1952. Many of the secrets and the direction of the show uh, was adapted to further highlight Morgan's acerbic, uh, acerbic persona, since that was really effective and that drew the audience. He stayed with the show for its original 14 season run and when it went to syndication in 72 and then later to CBS for a summer run in 1976, he was on board with that as well. Unfortunately, Morgan was not a happy man as most like him are not happy. Howard Stern never seemed happy. In fact, he also seemed tortured until he, and I'm talking about Howard Stern, until he gave up that shock jock persona and decided to be more of a serious interviewer and, a, and to comment on life around him rather than be a cartoon. Morgan was briefly blacklisted because his wife attended communist meetings, although he himself was no communist. He was also self-deprecating, much like Howard Stern. Veteran radio broadcaster and friend Ed uh, Herlihy said, quote, he was ahead of his time but he was also hurt by his own disposition. He was very difficult. He was so brilliant that he'd get exasperated and he'd sulk. He was a great mind who never achieved the success he should have, unquote. Character actor friend Arnold Stang said, quote, he was a masochist, a neurotic man. When things were going well for him, he would do something to destroy himself. He just couldn't deal with success. He had an unhappy childhood that warped him a little and gave him a sour outlook on life. He had no close friends, unquote. Henry Morgan, a -a three-pack-a-day cigarette smoker, died of lung cancer on May 19, 1994, at the age of 79, which, for smoking three packs of cigarettes, is not a bad age to die. A little interesting trivia is that Harry Morgan, who starred in Dragnet and M.A.S.H., Uh, We're talking about that actor now, had used the name Henry Morgan as his pseudonym since his birth name was Harry Brotsberg. Harry decided to use his real first name, Harry, since it was used, uh, since Henry was first used by our star tonight, Henry Morgan. So for the next 40 years, people often confuse the two actors. And that will do it for tonight. Also featured in our cast with Henry Morgan was Wally Mayer. The episode was written by George Bellock and Ben Kerner. William Spear was our director. Joe Kearns, our announcer. That was Dream Song from November 6th, 1947, here on the Suspense Radio Podcast on Radio Metropolis. Radio Metropolis.